now then, yes. Uh, contentious talk title, but um, what I really want to do is give you something to think about and try and um, uh, present maybe a few clues as to how the future might look in maybe 10 years' time. I feel at the moment we're kind of at the beginning of a story, um, a bit like the internet back in like 95, and it took a while for the internet to, be, to turn into what it is today. I think it's going to take a while for these decentralized consensus methods to, uh, to turn into what they will eventually become. Um, okay, so what I want to try and get across is a notion of a, um, of a, a bunch of organizations, entities, establishment people that are um, largely in control of our interactions. And it's a bit of a sort of crazy thing. We probably don't want to think too much about it because in general, we quite like the idea of being free. It's a very pervasive idea. It's very attractive to us. Um, but in fact, we're not all that free. Um, who here uh, bought a ticket online? Put your hands up. All right, take your hands down if you paid for the ticket with Bitcoin. Keep your hands up otherwise. Quite a lot of people. Now, why would you have to go to a third party to authorize the fact that you actually want to come to this festival? Because that's what you did, right? You appealed to a third party, to your bank or to your payment processor, Visa, MasterCard, who are owned by banks anyway, um, in order to uh, vouch for you so that you could actually come here, so that you could buy that ticket. So what I want to get across to you is the idea that for us to interact with each other in this world, with the exception of fairly minor interpersonal interactions, we have to actually appeal to third parties. There are many third parties that exist. The most obvious ones are the government and the banks, but there are actually many others, all the way from like insurance companies to dating agencies. And they all allow us to interact with each other, to interact with people that we don't necessarily trust and organizations that we don't necessarily trust. These guys, in some sense, protect us from predators. They say they protect our identities. They look after our identities. They act as a proxy for our identity, right? They authorize, they continue to authorize things that we want them to authorize. Unfortunately, of course, um, it's not often that these guys' primary business concern is with protection of our identities. Most of their primary business concern is with the provision of goods and services. And so, all too often, they fail in the protection of our identities. They fail in the protection of our authorizations. Why does the system work? Well, it works because we've actually, we've got to a point where we're, we're kind of happy just getting along with them in that, in that vaulted place. And as long as they stay in that vaulted, vaulted place, they'll, they'll try and protect themselves to continue in that vaulted place. And many of the people that, that are in that place have been there for you know very, very long time. Banks more or less stayed unchanged for decades, if not centuries. Um, same with like law firms, right? Law firms have barely changed their processes for, for centuries. And the fact of the matter is that it's very difficult, we, very difficult to live our globalized lives without such, such entities. We, we do need to be able to, uh, to place trust in each other when we want to do interactions because words are cheap, right? We can't trust that the words will be followed through by real action. Words are cheap, action is everything. But we're getting to a point where this, the, the, tr the fabric of trust that this kind of, um, this system is based upon is starting to wear a bit thin. It's wearing thin partly because of incompetence and misbehavior, as has been sort of demonstrated over the past few years, and partly because it's actually, technology is moving on. Uh, by and large, the companies and the enterprises that we're talking about that, that are sitting between us are very much a sort of paper-based world. And we're moving very much into a, into a digital-based world. And the, t the processes don't really carry on. It's almost like um, uh, when we talk about moving such enterprises into a digital world, it's almost like a facelift. It's a largely superficial addition to it. We're not really fundamentally altering how these systems work. We're just kind of um, providing a different medium on which they can work. But it turns out there's actually a new way of doing things that's different to the old way. It's different to the way of actually placing very large, um, unchanging um, status quo establishments in vaulted positions of trust in our society and then using them as middlemen. It's called trustless consensus computing, 
Some of you might know it as Bitcoin or the blockchain or Ethereum. All part of the same family, and it's all ways of basically rewriting the rules on how we as people can interact with each other when we don't necessarily know each other before. In essence, the difference between these things is that Bitcoin is a very specific application of this kind of trustless consensus computing or blockchain. Bitcoin is all about having a currency. Ethereum kind of moves things on a bit and says, well, actually, let's, let's not just concentrate on having a currency, but let's actually have an arbitrary set of rules so that we can make arbitrary ways of interacting with each other, both kind of um, as currency, maybe as contracts where we actually have bilateral agreements with each other, but potentially as multilateral contracts or very, um, very rich ways of um, controlling what the ramifications of particular interactions are down the line so we can invent new ways of organizing and collaborating, things like DAOs and DACs that were kind of unthought of 10 or 20 years ago. So what I want to what I want to sort of give an idea of now is if we have these kind, this kind of infrastructure in society, what's possible? Well, the first thing is that the old way of doing things is going to become less and less uh, tenable. Having these very, very large um, entities uh, that provide trust within society is going to become an an odd artifact of the past because we no longer need it in much the same way as um, sending uh, bank statements out through snail mail is kind of slowly becoming an old artifact of the past because to be honest we have the infrastructure now to be able to look at our bank accounts online why would we need that and as time goes on it's not just going to be online it's on our mobile phones eventually it'll be on our watches the idea of omnipotent um, forces in society, like essentially omnipotent banks, like gatekeeper lawyers or gatekeeper law firms, where that are essentially are uh, there to rubber stamp particular transactions or interactions in society, like the notion of just a 1% uh, automatic fee for notaries, <laughs> like uh, the notion of a very large percentage for payment processes like PayPal to act as escrow agents. That will become untenable. We will just get, th there will be alternative means of doing those things without those costs, without those restrictions. Now, one of the newer things that's going to be brought in is a notion that, uh, th uh, that proxies for authority are going to sort of slide away. They're just going to evaporate. And in its place, we will have our own authority. We'll have authorization over our own interactions. So what do I mean by proxy authority? Well, when you go to your bank to say, hey, bank, please pay the organizers of, uh, of WeShareFest. Uh, please pay them so that I can get a ticket. That's, that's a proxy authorization, right? You're not actually in control of your money. The bank is in control of your money. And in principle, actually, the government is in control of the money underlying that. Yeah? So in the future, we're going to have actual authority over what we have, over what we think we own. No longer will we have to go to a, a proxy organization in order to actually do the thing that we want them to do, but rather we'll be able to do it ourselves directly. And that's going to be kind of an odd return to our roots as sort of tribal kind of people where um, all of our interactions were done on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. At the moment, they're not done on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. They're done through a centralized authority. In this new world of a largely peer-to-peer -peer trustless interaction, we're going to need a whole new wave of enterprises, a whole new wave of, of sort of facilitators in order to help us matchmake. And these are going to require new technologies in order to sort of guide people from not knowing perhaps anything about the particular domain in which they want to interact into the point that they're, that they're happy with. And these are going to be advisors and facilitators. We're going to need people to help us secure our, our authority so that we don't accidentally lose it to some malicious actor and to transition us from where we are now to where we're going to be. And also to help organize, organize everyone around uh, within this new um, sort of peer-to-peer -peer system so that people can actually um, get to where they want to be within it and find the, um, the, the kinds of transactions that they want to do and do them very easily. We're going to need new services. We're going to need new services 
that take advantage of this notion that transactions are, are essentially free, right? So we've got like zero marginal cost transactions. In a zero marginal cost transaction system, it's, we open up this entire um, wealth of possible interactions that are just not doable at the moment because transactions cost so much. To do, for society to generally transact with other, with, within itself, we have to pay a trusted third party who have to um, be around for a long time to gain the trust that they're not just going to go away and pull their money with them. That trust is going, but of course technology is going to come in and replace that. And so when we can replace that with something that doesn't just cost very little, but actually costs nothing at all, all sorts of ways of cooperating and coordinating activity, economic or otherwise, um, can come into fruition that we just can't really imagine at the moment because it's, it's, it's at the bottom of the stack. It's at the stack where um, it's just not worth doing because it costs too much. And when we kind of free this portion of the stack, we're going to see a whole lot more social interaction become possible, the likes of which we haven't really seen before. And finally, there's a notion of um, additional kind of freedoms that we're going to be able to take advantage of in a world where, at the moment, the need to, um, to regulate these authorities kind of um, uh, removes the possibility of these particular freedoms. So um, essentially, when KYC and AML laws can be rescinded, because actually we know by and large where all of the money comes from in some sense, or are at least able to um, provide very clear proof of where the money has come from, then all sorts of other freedoms are likely to become um, available that would otherwise not be. I don't think there's any time for questions, but there was my little talk. I hope it's made you think a little about the future.